Hello everyone, welcome to our latest book trip live chat where you can ask authors your burning questions and win copies of their latest books. Today we are talking to New York Times bestselling author Wiley Cash. Welcome Wiley. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. Um, Wiley is the New York Times bestselling author of A Land More Kind Than Home and his re latest release is This Dark Road to Mercy. A Land More Kind Than Home appeared on the New York Times bestsellers list in hardcover paperback and ebook. Um, the New York Times also named it an editor's choice and a notable book of 2012. A Land More Kind Than Home also won the Southern Independent Bookseller Alliance's Book Award for Fiction of the Year and the John Creasy New Blood Dagger Award from the UK Crime Writers Association. Wiley's second novel, This Dark Road to Mercy, was released <laughs> by William Morrow and HarperCollins Publishers in January. So don't forget to sign up on Book Trip after the chat and enter to win a copy of Wiley's new book, This Dark Road to Mercy. Welcome to the live chat, Wiley, once again. And before we get to the questions, can you tell us a bit more about This Dark Road to Mercy? Sure. It is about a washed up minor league baseball player who kidnapped his two daughters from across the home in my hometown of Gastonia, North Carolina. And this guy is, is a bit of a loser. He signed away his parental rights to these two girls years before, and he's disappeared out of their lives. And so when he shows back up, he has to convince them to go with him. And he has a lot of people looking for him. So that's, that's pretty much how the book starts. Great. That sounds interesting. Very nice. Um, so we have a couple questions. I actually, first off, before the questions, I was interested in um, your teaching, the, the courses that you teach in fiction and nonfiction at Southern New Hampshire University. Um, I remember taking a Southern Gothic and um, Southern writing course. I don't know if you kind of go for some of those books when you're teaching. Um, what are your go-to books when you're trying to teach um, your courses? Well, it depends. The program I teach in is a low residency program. And so the syllabi, are, the syllabus is different for each student. And so when I tailor their reading list for the course of the semester, because I work with the students individually. And so when I tailor their reading list that they'll be you know, reading during the course of the semester, they read like eight novels, two craft books. I always tailor it to kind of resonate with what they're trying to do in terms of their own writing and what I would like to see them reach for in terms of my expectations. And so I assign all kinds of stuff, but I'm, uh, I'm pretty, um, I'm pretty uh, dedicated to the books my friends have written. So whenever I have a good book that I think will fill a need uh, that a buddy of mine has written, I'll, I'll try to assign that one just because I think having a personal tie to a book and knowing a little bit about the background of the writer and how he or she created this character or this plot or this idea will help me in talking to a student about his or her own work. Great. Um, Amy has a question. The questions are just rolling in right now. Um, she says, which is stronger, family ties or underworld? Um, in this book, I think that uh, the family ties hopefully are, are stronger. Um, I can't speak for my own life. I've never, haven't had too many dealings with the, uh, with the underworld, uh, the, the crime underworld uh, or otherwise. But this is a novel about family and it's about uh, the seemingly breakable bonds, but what we find most often are the unbreakable bonds of family. And so I would say in this novel, the ties to family are definitely the strongest. Cool, the next question that we have is um, Ava asks, three professions you'd like to give a try if you couldn't write or teach anymore? Gosh, I don't know. You know, I've never, I've done a lot of things. You know, um, I was in school for a long time, so I waited tables and I was terrible at that. I was a lifeguard and I really liked that. I hope I don't pay for it later in terms of uh, skin issues, but, um, you know, I've done a lot of things. I, I think I'd probably do something with my hands. I think maybe home renovation, or I've always said cutting grass on a golf course, just the kind of thing where you can do it and see your results at the end of the day, which is the nice thing about writing, because I can sit down and work all day and I can see my results at the end of the day. When you're teaching, sometimes you can't see those results, and that can be a little bit frustrating. Yeah, it's, it's hard to imagine. It's, it's something you're not doing, but you think of sometimes in the future, so it's, it's interesting. 
Um, Brenda asks, how have the fans been? Do you get to talk to them a lot on social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter, et cetera? And book trip? Uh, yeah, the fan the fans have been great. I, I interact with fans a lot, and I, I think of them more in terms of readers and not not so much fans. I think of like uh, you know somebody cool having fans, like a musician or an actor, but writers really aren't that cool. So I'll just say readers. Um, so yeah, I interact with them a lot on Facebook and Twitter. I get messages from them. Um, I'll see things they write about my books on Twitter if they tag me in it. Uh, and I meet a lot of readers on the road. You know, this this book tour for This Dark Road to Mercy has me visiting about 48 cities. Um, and I've just been home for a couple of days. And next week, I go back out on the road for another event or two. So I interact with readers all the time. And I, I really like it. You know, it's, it's, it's validating in a way that I think few other jobs would be. Even if they don't necessarily like the book you wrote or the decisions you made, you know that somebody's picked up your work and had a reaction to it. Uh, it was wonderful. That's really validating and just valuable to have those people, you know, rooting for you. It's awesome. Oh, yeah. Especially when you when I have events, you know, if I go to what's been really cool about this tour too is this is my second book. And so for example, I was in Asheville, North Carolina with my first book and we had a really, really big crowd. And then on this new tour, we had over 200 people, and they shut the doors and wouldn't let anybody else in. I was just in Swickley, Pennsylvania, and my first tour, we probably had 10 people at my event. And then this new tour, we might have had 30 there. And so it's really nice to see the events getting bigger, you know, even when they're not huge, but to know that more people are reading my books than they were two years ago is really wonderful for me to see that. Excellent. Um, Dylan has a question. Your debut novel, A Land More Kind Than Home, was a huge success. Congrats, by the way, he says. Um, did you feel any added pressure to live up to your first novel? Um, I didn't feel pressure to live up to the first novel because I saw them as being um, very separate. You know, and I, and I didn't want to be the parent who says, you know, I wish you were more like your brother or more like your sister. Um, so I never thought of them as being a package deal. I thought of them and whatever success or, or failure they brought as being very distinct. But what I did think about was with my first novel, I was terrified that nobody was going to read it. Because I was this writer that nobody had ever heard of. I had this obscure book with a long title set in the mountains of North Carolina. And I thought, you know, there's, there's a good chance this book will never, never be read. And then people actually read it, and I was really, really surprised. And then with the second novel, you're a little bit afraid that people are actually going to read it, you know, because you know what it's like to have that attention paid to something that you've worked really hard on. And so I didn't worry about the success of my new book in comparison to the success of the first, but I did worry about the attention it might get, you know. Uh, <laughs> knowing what it felt like to have somebody read your work, you know, because before you're published, you spend years in obscurity and you so desperately want somebody to validate all this stuff you've been working on. And then once you've had that, you kind of think like, oh, that's enough. I'm fine. I don't want anybody to read anything else anymore, you know, but then they do. And so there's, there's a little bit of fear there, but never fears in terms of the comparison. <laughs> right. Um, Dylan says, uh, what made you decide you wanted your new book to be set in Western North Carolina? Um, well, my first novel is set high up in the mountains in Western North Carolina. Uh, this new book is set in, in Gastonia, which is a little bit down the mountain between uh, places like Asheville. It's about an hour and a half east of Asheville. So it's still, you know, considered the western part of the state, but that's just the part of the state that I know the best. We live my wife and I now live in Wilmington, North Carolina, which is on the coast. Um, that's where she's from. My family lives here. Her family lives here. My brother lives here. But the western part of the state is definitely the part of the state that I know the best. When people throw the names of towns around like Shelby or Hickory or Boone or Lenore or Silva or Asheville, I can picture those places not only because I know them intimately, I can picture them geographically on a map. But in eastern North Carolina, when people th start throwing around you know, names like Moorhead City and Greenville and Jacksonville, I, 
Washington. I have no idea where those places are because I'm not as familiar with this part of the state. And so there's an old maxim that says, write what you know. And what I know is Western North Carolina. Is everything okay? Right about. Um, Tyler brings up an interesting point. Uh, your new book is narrated by alternating voices. Did you find that style of writing difficult? And uh, what drew you to telling the story in three different voices? No, I really didn't find it that difficult because the characters are so different. The first narrator is a 12-year-old girl. She's the, the daughter of this, you know, washed-up baseball player. Uh, the second narrator is, you know, a 40-something guardian ad life appointed by the court. He's a man. And the third narrator is this steroid-fueled, enraged bounty hunter who's probably in his late 30s. And all of these characters were very different. Their, their life experiences were different, their genders were different, their ages were different, their social classes were different, and their knowledge of the events in the novel were all very different. And so when it came time for them to speak, I just honored their differences, and there were very few similarities between them, so it wasn't hard for them to be distinct. And I think that I decided to have three narrators so that the novel would feel round and full. Because if just Easter was a narrator, first of all, it would have been very short, but Easter doesn't know her father's past. She doesn't understand the legal implications of him kidnapping them. So I had to bring these other narrators in to tell the story. Makes sense. I remember reading The Sound and the Fury in college. And that was several voices. I actually liked it, but some people really struggled through it. But well, that's, a, that's also a really difficult I thought it was great. Read. It, even individually, those perspectives are very hard, especially somebody like Benji, who's mentally handicapped. He narrates from a very different perspective than, say, somebody like that. You know? But these, these multi-voice narratives, they're not particular to the South, but they're definitely popular in the South. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Claire says, um, I read that this book was stemmed from a beautiful story your wife told you and a tragic story from your past. Uh, do you often find inspiration in your real life scenarios? Is it ever hard to come up with a fresh new idea? Um, you know, there was a North Carolina writer named Charles Chestnut who died in 1932 who said, Something to the effect of, all fiction is the power of rearranging your memory. And I think that's true for me. Um, every story I've written, or every novel I've Absolutely. written, is only two. But they've all stemmed in some way from something I've heard, something I've read, something I've experienced. And I think that's probably true for every author, whether he or she wants to admit it or thinks about it. Um, so the story for This Dark Road to Mercy comes from a story my wife told me about playing softball when she was a little girl. She didn't know how to slide into base. And so her dad would take her out to the baseball diamond and help her learn how to slide into base. So I had this image of a father and a daughter on a baseball field. And I thought, well, what kind of tensions could there be between these two people? And my novel opens with a little girl standing on third base, seeing her dad in the stands and being disappointed that he's there. Great answer. Um, Brenda wants to know, are there any books, old or new, that you would recommend to your readers? Gosh, there's so many books I'd recommend. Um, I just finished the, the book Cycle of Lies about Lance Armstrong. It just came out, I think, last week. That was a really fun, really fun read. I was traveling last week, so I read it really, really quickly. Um, let's see what else is out um, now that I'm really liking. A novel by a buddy of mine called The Kept. Um, it's getting a lot of attention. Um, gosh, what else have I read lately that I really like? Funny people say, what do you think? You think hey, <laughs> it's a hard question sometimes. I know, because I've, I've read so many things. You know, when I travel, I visit so many of these independent bookstores, and the booksellers just put stuff in your hand that they're, that they're enjoying. And it kind of guides me in my reading uh, a lot of the time. Right now I'm reading Jen, uh, James Salter's All That Is the novel set in post-World War II America. Um, it's really good. Um, just finished Flannery O'Connor's collection of letters, uh, The Habit of Being. That was really, really interesting. 
Um, but in terms of my own writing style, three books that have affected me more than any other are Look Homeward Angel by Thomas Wolfe in terms of writing about the place you're from, Pain by Jean Toomer uh, in terms of just the lyricism of the language, and uh, uh, Of Love and Dust by Ernest Gaines because I think that book is just so firmly rooted in place, so beautifully written. So those are the three novels that have affected me. Excellent. Um, any favorite bookstores? Gosh, uh, again, that's like saying favorite children. Uh, <laughs> I like, I, I guess I can say I like bookstores where I get good turnouts. So I like Malaprops in Asheville, North Carolina, a whole lot. Pomegranate Books, just down the street from me here in Wilmington, North Carolina. Hub City Bookshop in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Oh, awesome. Great. Um, the Penguin Bookshop in Swickley, where I just came from. Blue Willow Bookshop in Houston is, a, is a, just been an incredible supporter of mine. Tattered Cover uh, out in Denver has really been just wonderful to me. Um, mm -hmm. It's a great one. So many. I, I love visiting bookstores. There's just so many that have just meant a lot to me in terms of getting off the ground. Park Road Books in Charlotte has been a huge support. Uh, even, and, and, you know, newer bookstores like Fireside Books in Shelby, North Carolina. There's a lot out there that meant a lot to me. There's so many. It's my favorite thing to do on a rainy day. Absolutely. Um, Claire has an interesting question again. When you're writing, do you have the ending in mind already? Um, some authors write the ending first. What's your process like? Um, you know, I, I think I know kind of the trajectory of how things are going to go. I posted a, an essay on Book Trip's website yesterday about trying to create characters over plot. And I feel like if I have interest in characters I believe in, they'll lead me to the destination of some kind of conclusion. Um, and I don't really think of the, the last page of my book as an ending. I think, as it, I think of it as just the point where I stopped writing the story of these people. Not that their stories exist and go on like in some weird you know, metaphorical way, but I don't really think of them as the end. I just think of them as the place where I stopped writing about them. And I don't ever know exactly what that ending's going to be or where it's going. So, for example, with this dark road to mercy, I thought the novel would end in St. Louis on the day that uh, Mark McGuire ties Roger Maris's home run record and, and 1998, but it doesn't. It goes a few weeks past that, and I, I didn't see that coming. Um, now, moving from books to TV, Jenkins wants to know, what are a few of your favorite TV shows that you're watching these days? Um, that's a tough question. I don't, I don't watch, uh, it's not that I don't watch TV, but I don't watch the serial TV. Like, I've, it's embarrassing to say this, I've never seen Breaking Bad or um, Downton Abbey or, uh, I've seen a few Downton episodes Abbey's of House great. of Cards. House of Cards, I saw a few episodes of that. That was really fun. And I watched the first season of The Sopranos and the first two seasons of The Wire. But there's just something about like um, getting into a series and then feeling like you have to watch it that makes me just not want to get into it. Because I don't want to feel like I have to watch it. Um, but my wife was a yeah. at Breaking Bad. And she's a brilliant reader and also a brilliant watcher of movies and TV shows. And the stuff she would say about Breaking Bad Having never seen it, I'm still convinced it's like the greatest TV show of all time. And I keep telling myself, I just need to start with season one on Netflix and start watching it. And I really don't know why I haven't. It's not that I don't watch TV, because I do, but I just never watch the serial stuff. And I know I should, um, but I just, I just haven't. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> I don't watch too much either, but I don't have cable, so... Maybe there you go. <laughs> Netflix time. I watch a lot of sports. I watch, um, you know, w one TV show that I'm always excited. I travel constantly. And whenever I go to a hotel room, I turn on ESPN and see what's on. And then I look for cops. Like if cops is on, I'm satisfied. Great. Oh, another question just popped up um, from Ava. Do any of your students read your books? And if so, do they ever tell you what they think of them? <laughs> um, I never assigned, I may have had one student in this MFA program read my book 
my first novel when she was working on uh, a multi-voice narrative. I may have assigned it then so I could talk about the decisions I made compared to the decisions she made. But I think that's the only one. She loved it. So another TV question. Oh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. I said, I said, and my student loved my book because everybody who reads it loves my book. But I'm just kidding. Right. Absolutely. Um, Tiny Book Monkey asks, could you see either of your books turn into a television series? And do you have a type of dream cast in mind? Yeah, my second novel's just been optioned, so I would love to see that turn into, you know, a TV series. You know, my, my friends who are starting to have things optioned in this post-long form world, long form TV, like a series like Walking Dead or Breaking Bad or The Wire, that's like what's everybody's dream production. Like movies, the two hour movie has kind of fallen by the wayside in favor of these longer dramas where you can really develop characterization and relationships. And so I think it would be spectacular if that would happen to me. I'd love it. Uh, for this new book, I'd love to see Matthew McConaughey play uh, the girl's father, Wade. I know he's you know kind of blown up with Dallas Buyers Club, but I think he would do a great job. Nice choice. Um, Tiny Book Monkey also asks, one misconception people have about authors. Um, one conception, misconception people have about authors and, and writers and writing in general is that it's any different than any other kind of job. It's not mystical, it's not romantic, it's not any more special than doing anything else is. You know, you sit down, you go to work, and you do the work, and some days you have good days, and some days you have bad days. Um, but to think that it, you know, is it, that I that I get, you know, mission to do certain things because I'm a writer or uh, you get to act a certain way because you're a writer is, is crazy. You know, that, that's an ideology that's built on these, the post-war school of these white male writers who wanted to live this excessive lifestyle and wanted permission to just very bad behavior and wanted people to believe they were exceptional for whatever reason. And that's just not the case. And I think that that's really fallen away. And I think social media does a great job of making that, making that fall away. I mean, you can get on Twitter and find yeah. out what Salman Rushdie's buying at the grocery store because he'll tell you. You know, it's kind of hard to believe that he's a god and he's like at, you know, food line buying raisins or whatever. Very cool. Um, Susan Page asks an interesting question. You mentioned the name of the bar where you met your wife during your last live chat. Um, she was telling someone the story, but couldn't remember the very cool name. Uh, can you remind her, please? Rum Runners. Rum Runners in downtown Wilmington. It's no longer there. The building's there, but the bar's not there anymore. I, I think it's like called No Limit City Saloon or something something like that. But it was called Rum Runners. It was a, pian a dueling piano bar. It's very classy. Nice. Perfect name. <laughs> Um, Karen Terry asks, did you always want to write a novel or did you recently get into writing? I'd always written. I grew up as a reader in Gastonia, so I read my entire life. And so it wasn't long before I was trying to write stories. And I went to college and majoring in creative writing and American literature. Um, I pursued a PhD in American literature to make sure that I read enough that I would have some to draw from when I tried to write. So. I've always known I wanted to write. Um, but A Landmark Kind of Homes, the first novel I ever tried to write, I'd always just written and published short stories until then. And so I've, I've only written two novels. So I don't have a lot of experience doing that, but I'm still, I'm still working on it, trying to get better. Um, Audrey Curley wants to know, do you use social media like some authors to get ideas on names of characters and towns, et cetera? Um, no, I don't, I don't really know where am I, most of the towns I write about are real, and so those, those names already exist for me, and in terms of characters' names, I don't really know where those come from, you know, the girl's father in this novel is named Wade Chesterfield, and that felt like a good baseball name to me, and so it just kind of stuck, but I try not to use the names of people I know, and especially the names of people I don't know, 
in creating characters. Um, the name just kind of come to me, you know, they, they feel like their names would be blank and then I kind of name them. Um, Amy wants to know, how did your experience writing a land more kind than home influence your writing process for this latest novel and did you learn anything along the way? Yeah, sure. I learned how to write a book. You know, I learned how to move uh, things forward. I learned how to organize scenes so that the end of the scene propels the reader into the following scene, if they'll want to keep going. Um, I learned the rhythm of writing, you know, of how long it would take me to write a manuscript that's 300 pages. Um, I learned how to develop scenes to keep them necessary and, and moving. So I, I absolutely, I learned, I learned a lot uh, by trial and error in writing my first book that I was able to apply in writing my second book. Great. Excellent. Um, so we're at the end of our questions, but I just wanted to thank you for joining us today for the live chat. Again, it was great to have you. And a reminder to everyone to please visit booktrib.com and sign up to win a copy of this Dark Road to Mercy today. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining us, Wiley. It was great to have you. See you later. Bye-bye.